I mean, you're asking a person who, when they didn't have any money, was at the Commodore every night, like eating like fried chicken and drinking pina coladas. And I was like, this is the money I have and this is what makes me happy. So I'm doing it. And then would like overdraft their bank account. So. Hello, everybody. I'm Allison Roman and welcome to Solicited Advice, the podcast where I get to do what I love most, give advice. Each week, I'm joined by a very special guest and several very special advice seekers as we do our best to solve all of, or at least one of, your problems. Otego Wagba is a best-selling author and culture journalist who has written three, count them three books, Little Black Book, A Toolkit for Working Women, We Need to Talk About Money, and Whites, On Race and Other Falsehoods. She's contributed to publications such as The Guardian, Vogue, Harper's Bazaar, New York Magazine, et cetera, et cetera. And of course, she's got a Substack. You can read all about her monthly newsletter, fashion, wishes, dreams, hopes, shopping habits. It's called Add to Wishlist, and it is definitely worth a subscribe. No, I'm good. How are you? I'm great. Are you in your flat, your new flat? <laughs> I am. I am. I'm in the kitchen because um, it has the best light. Um, and yeah, I can see. Where are you recording home movies from at the moment? Because I feel like I saw you say something about a different kitchen. Yeah, I'm uh, recording them upstate now. So my place oh. upstate, I bought it like three years ago and just have been like working on it. And um, I am going to probably have to move out of this apartment in the next year, if not sooner. Um, mm. And I'm just like, what am I going to do? Like move apartments every th- It's just like, I was like enough. And I, I just was like, I couldn't do it anymore. And I also like finding an apartment in New York that I could also film in felt like really tough, like increasingly challenging. And I was just like, I can't let that be the thing that stops me from moving (laughs) when I need to move. So when, no, totally. But so when you move out of this apartment, the Brooklyn apartment, are you still going to have a place in New York in the city, but you're not going to be as bothered about it being like a kitchen that you can film in basically? Yeah. Max is, I mean, we both want to stay here. Like we're, we both feel sort of feel like gently being pushed out of New York, but also like we have to like spend less time here, but both still very much like, well, we want to, we want to be here. It feels like a little bit like giving up to move out. Mm -hmm. Like, yeah, no, I get that. I don't know, but it's like when you're younger, the things that you're willing to put up with, there's just more of it. It's like, a shittier apartment, like having less money to go out, like more expensive things where you're like, well, I don't have that much money, so I'm just going to spend it all on dinner or whatever. And like the trash and the the chaos, you're, it's like when you're younger, you just, I, I think you accept I it more. I notice those things when you're younger because I've sometimes been like, I'm like, has London and the UK, has the weather always been this bad? Or am I just noticing it more? Or like things about London that like, really bother me now I'm like has it always been this way I was like no I think it has always been this way but I've changed and it doesn't just like bounce off me in the way that it obviously used to when I was younger so yeah that's how I feel about pretty much everything here but also the rent has not to be like you know the rent but the rent has really gotten to a place in New York where I wonder how people move here like yeah oh the same thing in London yeah I'm like who's moving here and and where are you living and like what is happening and like you I guess it's kind of like LA where people just move further and further and further away from what used to be the epicenter and then new neighborhoods form and like you know life goes on and you know whatever everything continues but for someone who's been here now for 14 years I'm like I don't want to move further and further away I want to stay where I am but I can't afford to live where I am and it's it gets it's brutal yeah, I think, yeah, the rents in London are similarly crazy. I mean, I think New York rent has always been, like, more, even when you factor in, like, salaries. But I just feel like or even if you are, like, making it work, it does affect the, like, fabric of a city. And I, that's something that I have really felt, I'd say, in the past, like, three to four years. Because pre-pandemic, I was, like, a diehard Londoner. Like, they'll have to carry me out of here in a body bag kind of thing. And now I'm like, oh, like, it just feels like even if I'm like, fine, like, okay, financially and like comfortable, I can do nice things. But like, 
the vibe is off. Like the sit, like I can feel that this isn't like a young city where people have money and things feel spontaneous and exciting and like it just feels different. But I don't know. Maybe that's just like a political thing. I'm also penning a lot of hope on our change of government at some point this year. But it also takes years for things to kind of. I just have like a memory of what London used to be like like fifteen years ago, and so in my head I'm still trying to get back to that. But I don't know if that'll happen. I've been having that conversation a lot lately of like, is it me or is it this? Is it like, is it time and aging or is it this, you know? And I feel like I, I don't actually have an answer where it's even like, uh, with like friend groups and people it's, but it's like, everything changes. Everything is different. I, I, do you have people that like moved out of London? Where do people go in London? Like if, if you live in London, London. yeah, where do they go? Oh, see, where are young people living now? A lot of them, I think, are living at home with their parents. So, like, obviously, that's from if you live in London. So, like, when I came of age and got, like, a decent paying job, I moved out. I don't think people are doing that. Like, it just doesn't make sense to, if your parents live in London or in the sort of outskirts or near and you can commute in, nobody is moving out to pay rent. And actually, people are moving back in if they were renting. Um, I think if you've moved here, like, you know for work or like you obviously don't have like parents in London I just think it's further and further out like really quite like obscure parts of London um that again 10 15 20 years ago it'd be like whoa like what are you doing there and like now it's like you don't ask that question or even ponder that question of anyone it's more like wow I can't believe like a 25 year old ad agency you know exec is living in Acton because that's the kind of place that people like used to retire to. And now it's, it's, and so that's the thing where I'm like, oh, it feels a little bit depressing because those people like being out and about in town just kind of makes London more fun. Like, even if I, you know, that's like below my age group, I'm not saying, but like, it makes things more vibey. They're putting things on that, are, like, in terms of like creatives, like everything either has to be a brand sponsored like event or initiative which don't get me wrong I accept those checks too but I'm like that does not necessarily foster doesn't foster creativity doesn't foster bravery like I know the constraints that they put on stuff but that's that's the only way of like sustaining creative practice in a lot of ways like even if you're doing like part-time and then you make time for your own stuff and I'm like I don't think that's a healthy way for the creative industries to work but that's like a whole different topic you should. It's, I mean, I've said it before. I'll say it again. Your voice is, I could listen to forever. But that's also how we met. We met on your podcast and then we became friends, which was really I nice. I know. <laughs> I know. And also, I think that must have been like five or six years ago now. Yeah, at right? least. Yeah, it was quite a while. It was, I think it was like 2018, I want to say. Yeah, it was really, really crazy. Um, but yeah, look look how much has changed. How well look at us now. now I know. Now you're in your flat. Yeah. Everybody knows that I love my cats. I love my cats so much that sometimes it's all I talk about. And I say, wow, I promised myself that I would never be the person to talk about their cats all the time. And yet here we are. But that's what happens when you have two perfect angels. The thing that I love about my cats is uh, how sweet and fluffy they are. And the thing that I don't like about my cats is that they poop in a box that's in my house. So if it were up to me, I would have a thing that could clean up the litter box for me, which luckily... That thing does exist. And it's called a litter robot. If you're a person that is interested in like the apps for your house, like if you're like, I have a Philips Hue app and like a Nest Cam and all this stuff, then guess what? You're in luck because Litter Robot also has an app and it will send a notification to you right to your phone to be like, oh, your cat pooped. Don't worry, I got it. And that's a notification that I can get behind, you know? As a special offer to listeners of solicited advice, you can go to stopscooping.com slash advice and enter promo code advice to save an extra $50 on any Litter Robot bundle. That's extra 50 off any Litter Robot bundle at stopscooping.com slash advice and enter promo code advice at checkout. A huge, beautiful, gorgeous thank you to Claritin for supporting this week's episode and providing us with samples. For those of us who live with the symptoms of allergies, i.e. me, we can live Claritin clear with Claritin D. It is designed for people that are allergic to things like cats, um, which is why I keep it on hand at my house because people come over and they're like, oh, do you have any Claritin? I'm allergic to your cats. And guess what? I do. Um, And for me, who steps outside from 
May 1st to July 31st and is just like absolutely assaulted with allergies. Um, if it blooms, it'll get me. And that makes it hard to live outside, which I try to do during the summer. Fast and powerful relief is just a quick trip away. Ask for Claritin D at your local pharmacy counter. You don't even need a prescription. Go to Claritin.com right now for a discount so you can live Claritin clear. Use as directed. Um, well, I didn't want to pigeonhole you, but you did write a fantastic book on money and finances um, called We Need to Talk About Money. And yeah. the, it, the the title sort of says it all. It is like obvious, but it is sort of like a, yeah, we do. Oh, can you hear that? Can you hear the honking? What's fine. We can leave it in. I live in New York. Um, <laughs> I think we do need to talk about money. And I, I think anyone who's who feels similarly or is just even curious about the sentiment that like we as a culture to have more transparency um, need to do a better job of talking about it with each other publicly, whatever. Um, especially I was talking about it the other day with somebody who, you know, has a podcast, writes books or whatever. And he's like, do you do ads for your podcast? And I was like, yeah, I was like, how, I don't, yeah. How, how else are we going to pay for this? You know, this takes money to produce and to get out there and, it's like, oh, well, like I, I'm going to start doing that. But like, what does an ad sell for? And like just certain basic things that it is sort of taboo in our culture to even bring up. But I would say that something like the book you wrote is more important now than ever because of how, uh, what's the right word? I don't know. Independent people are now in their careers. Like there's not, there's fewer people that work for a company where it's like, here's the salary and here's what the person before you made and da, 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 da. And you can talk to your coworkers. People are out there on their own and they're sort of like navigating this for the first time about like what their worth is and what things should cost and how much they should pay people if they're hiring. And like, it's really just, I don't know. I thought it was brilliant and well-written and like a very good resource for anybody. Thank you. I, I really appreciate that. I mean, it feels like a while ago now, but I, that book came from a place of anxiety, like deep, deep anxiety um about my relationship with money and just money in general and having grown up from a background that like you know like immigrant to the UK and like grew up on a council estate which like actually isn't far from where I live now and like growing up without very much money we weren't like poor I always I use that word very sparingly I'm like we weren't poor but there wasn't a lot of money and there were some tough times and I think that gave me a lot of anxiety around money and always like worrying about like being without and I think I only kind of really realized that as I got into adulthood and I did like loads of like irrational things like I think I was irrationally like hard on myself and like irrationally I don't think I've ever been like stingy or tight with other people I'd be very frugal like quite self-flagellating in terms of how I allowed myself to kind of enjoy or spend money or anything like that and I mean, but then the book came about because after my first book came out, or like in the run up to my first book, I was getting like all the like hype and buzz and it's like, oh my gosh, like how exciting, you've got a book coming out and everybody like, you must be so excited, you must be so excited. And like, you're doing press and like a photo shoot. And I remember walking home one evening and at this point I was still living at my parents' house. This is in my twenties and feeling really, really like upset and like anxious about money because I had been, I think I'd been self-employed then for like about a year. I wasn't making that much money. I wasn't really sure where my career was gonna go. Like I had no idea what I was doing essentially. And I just really felt the tension between that kind of like external persona of success and how I internally felt about money. And I just decided that I wanted to, yeah, to write about it. I, was, I just knew that other people must feel similarly anxious and lo and behold, they do. <laughs> Yeah, they very much do. And I bet it helped a lot of people. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's it's like also a topic that I feel like is almost exclusively written about by men. <laughs> um, just like historically or like they're the expert in something about finances. But it was also just a very curious book. And that I think is what makes for good reading because it didn't feel prescriptive. It felt like, I don't know, good for like posing questions and getting people to think about it. Um, which... Brings me to today's podcast <laughs> um, because today we are talking to people who have questions about money, not necessarily like what should I do with it, but sort of the, oh, Otega is taking us on an impromptu house tour. And if there's anyone 
here who knows what it's like to not have basic Wi-Fi in their place that they live. It's me because I like my, well, not only is my street outside constantly being ripped up by spectrum to just like improve the Wi-Fi, and in doing so cuts out the Wi-Fi. but even after they've repaired it, like I can't make a simple phone call. And I live in like the center of Brooklyn. I live right in the middle of it all. Even when I am upstate, I have better service and a better connection. It's, I, I think the city is overwhelmed. Well, uh, yeah, I think it's a similar thing here. I think the Wi-Fi in my flat is really bad, but I never notice because I'm just like kind of on my phone and like it just kind of switches in and out. But I've given you the impromptu house tour. Alison, at some point I have to give you the real house tour. Well, I'll be there, there in June and we are going to hang out. Okay, so we have some callers that are going to be calling in live and then we have people that have left us voice and messages for the end. So we'll take our live callers now because they are on the line and they're sort of tangentially related to the topic of finances, um, which my favorite thing about the show, especially when we started doing like specific topics, which we did not do for the first season, is that it's really open to interpretation. And, but it is funny how so many things come back to money. So let's take our first caller. How can we help you today? Yes. So my boyfriend and I have been together for about seven years now. And so we've obviously discussed getting married and engaged and recently he approached me with a question that kind of took me aback a little bit. And he asked how I felt about lab grown diamonds for an engagement ring versus a natural diamond. And of course, initially I was a little offended because <laughs> I was like, I feel cheap or like cheated. Like I almost felt as if like I wasn't worth a, a real diamond. And to give a little background, my boyfriend is, is very frugal. Um, but that's not to say that he doesn't spend money on things that he thinks are worth it. Like experiences, when we travel, he knows I love food. So if ever I want to go to a specific restaurant, you know, like price isn't a question. Like he likes to treat me and things like that. But as far as materialistic things, he tends to be very conservative. Um, do you think that he's asking you this because he, well, to, I guess I have my, I have friends that she wanted a lab grown diamond because of like ethical reasons. She's like, I don't think it's ethical to buy a mine diamond and da, da, da. she didn't want something antique. Um, and I think it's almost like, uh, you know, when like wine, wine bottles started doing screw tops and people thought it was because it was cheap but it's oh. actually it's like environmentally friendly it's also like helps the there's something about production like there's like a million reasons on why but the perception is like well that's cheap and not as good as a cork bottle or whatever and I'm wondering like do you think that this reason is because he feels a way about it ethically or he's like I can save like a lot of money if I just do this both does he think you'd also be able to tell the difference no and we've, we've both done a lot of research on lab grown diamonds versus natural diamonds. And there is literally no difference. Like they are exactly the same. You cannot tell lab grown diamonds are real diamonds. And so the machine actually will read it as if it's diamond. Um, so they tested it on a mined diamond and then a lab grown diamond and the machine read them both as natural. There's a special like $6,000 machine that you can put these diamonds in and that will tell you whether or not it's a mine diamond or a lab grown diamond. Well, let me ask you, do you care? Yeah, I'll take a go ahead. <laughs> well, what I was going to say is, unless like, you know, you're kind of walking down the street and people are asking to examine your ring and putting under the screen, nobody else is going to know about yeah. this. What this is, I think clearly is more of like an emotional question where, you feel a little bit like oh I don't want to put words in your mouth but like it's important to you the kind of I guess the tradition and the idea that your boyfriend wants to spend is, is it supposed to be like three months that are like a chunk of money mm -hmm. on this diamond and I actually really understand that like I think I can imagine some people would kind of like just completely dismiss that kind of emotional component of it but I do get it especially as it's something you're going to be wearing every day probably for the rest of your life um, or like whether you kind of want to put it away. I think how I would frame it in my head, because I, I think I, if I was asked in that position, I probably wouldn't care because the 
ethical side of things would be a really important thing to be. And I'm not saying that it isn't to you and I'm not like judging if that isn't as high up in your consideration. No, it is, yeah. But, yeah, I, I just think, I think in years to come and decades to come, we will start to look at mind diamonds as a bit of like an antiquity. And I even know so many people who are moving towards lab grown diamonds. And these are people who have like all the money in the world, but it's like that is really their top choice. It's not about saving money. It's like this is where they want it sourced. I feel like for me, something that I would be thinking of is like where else can this money potentially be spent? The thousands of pounds or tens of thousands, whatever that you save, can be put towards something or an experience that's like really incredible as opposed to something that is going to like identically look the same and I also feel like you'd be surprised probably at like how much you won't care like as things go on like once the initial purchase has been made and like you've kind of gotten used to wearing it on your finger I'd be surprised if it's something that comes up a lot in your mind um I don't know that's just I my agree. thought but I feel like probably like decoupling any idea this is like how my boyfriend feels about my work or how much he's willing to spend on me from that and just kind of trying to make it a slightly less emotional conversation might help. Yeah, I tried to convince myself to, for some reason, subconsciously, I want to put the worth of the diamond as equal to the worth of the relationship. So like if he gives me like a big expensive diamond, like that's what our relationship is worth to him or whatever. But I realized consciously that that's really dumb. <laughs> it's so and... dumb, it's, but it's it does happen. And I, I understand that, but I also understand that like Otega is completely right that once it's on your hand, you're not going to think about it at all. I think about my ring all the time and how I've like, the first like several months, it was like all I thought about. And I would look at my hand and I was like, oh my God, oh my God. And now I'm like, oh, it's an extension of my hand. And like, and I, we had a conversation where I said, I like this design and I like the setting and I like the shape and size of this ring. I don't mm -hmm. care what the diamond itself is because when you go to like, look at a diamond, they'll be like, and then there's this one. And then there's this one that's like half a carat larger for $10,000 more. And you're like, and I'm like, honestly, guys, I don't care. And I was looking at them all and I was like, I like the setting and I like the way it looks and I like the band. That's mm -hmm. what I'm here for. And I would say that also like trying to exactly like divorce yourself from the, like, this is what I'm worth. But like, I think that's like an insecurity that if it shows up in other places in your relationship, I would examine, mm -hmm. um, or it's like, why don't you have a problem spending this, but you have a problem spending this. And maybe he's like, well, because eating dinner together is something we enjoy together. And like, it matters if the food is good or not. It matters if the restaurant is good or not. If this diamond is the same and it's 50% cheaper, like who would opt to spend the money really? Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? As long as you're like, well, the setting is what I want. The band is what I want. Mm -hmm. It looks how I want. And mm -hmm. you know what I mean? It's, I think it's like, we're also all old enough to hear like the words cubic zirconia and think of it as like a dirty word in jewelry. Yeah because that was like the diamond image. I don't know enough about jewels to know what I'm talking about, but I, I think mean, it was like, it was like the shitty diamond, right? It, like it was a fake diamond and people are like, oh my God, that's so insulting. It's not a real diamond, mm -hmm. right? But lab grown diamonds, completely different. Are, there are, because they are diamonds. Yeah, it's not like a like an imitation. It is a diamond. So- And also yeah. I think it's worth thinking about like what the diamond industry has done to like, this value on diamonds because they didn't used to be considered a particularly like valuable gem and also like all the names you can think of to be got like they hold like a stock of the majority of the world's diamonds in order to inflate the prices like I think when you also think about the fact that there's like a lot of marketing that's gone into mm -hmm. making you feel this way and who really stands to benefit from this so it's like okay well we could give an extra 20k to the beers or we could have this extra 20k within our relationship within our marriage within our home yeah. and put it towards yeah. things that will last a really long time like I feel like you're the one winning when it comes to that but it is I think as has been said it's like Ooh, it that's such good about, advice yeah that's a great yeah, that's a fantastic don't point. give it that's to the beers yeah make it anti-capitalist like, like you know <laughs> just like but yeah honestly like I, I really do get the emotional side of things 
but I think when you just yeah I feel like there are like there are probably a lot of other ways within your relationship that you could kind of make you spend money and that also that your boyfriend does make you feel loved and valued and just because this thing feels like what we've been told to believe like a woman's worth is in like the size of the rock it's like it's bullshit and like we all know so many celebrities who have like massive rocks on their fingers from like guys I just think it's it's really it, it doesn't say anything about like the health of a relationship or the strength of a relationship it is just marketing yeah there's a really excellent podcast episode from search engine which was one of my favorite podcasts on why are we still it's I think the episode's called why are we still buying diamonds and it's not like a judgy question. It's really just like, why do we still think that they're the best? Yeah. Um, I also know a lot of women who are like, I wanted an emerald. I wanted a ruby. I wanted an opal. I wanted a yellow diamond, like whatever. Like there's so many, there's a lot of diversification in jewelry. But to Otega's point, there is like a real top down sort of like capitalist structure to keep diamonds at the top, both in our minds and like a value system. Um, but that's on purpose. And so- yeah, I mean, my whole takeaway is don't give your money to De Beers. No offense to De Beers. <laughs> we can give it to Viking or Wolf. Yeah, something that you'll <laughs> enjoy together. But I, I wouldn't internalize it as like feeling offended. But I, and I think you have to also ask yourself the question like, do I need this to feel validated? And the answer is no. I mean, no. I know I'm very secure in our relationship and we have a very healthy relationship, a very happy relationship. Um, and I, that's why I said it was stupid for me to put the the worth of our relationship into the value of a piece of jewelry on my finger. That just... I think it comes up, but I, he sounds very pragmatic. If he's like, yeah, of course I want to spend money on this, but like, why would I spend money on a t-shirt or whatever? And like, you, I don't know, you can't, everyone feels differently about the way that they spend money. And if he's like, it's the same, I don't get it. He's not coming at it from like an emotional perspective. No, he's not. No, yeah. definitely all right. Well, I hope that was helpful. Otega, you really crushed that answer. Um, <laughs> that, the, bringing up I don't know how much I know about diamonds. So. <laughs> okay. No, but yeah, yeah, it's never really, it's like never really about the question. It's really about like the thing behind the question. So yeah. Yeah. A lot, a lot of really good advice. Thank you ladies very much. You're so welcome. Thank you so much for calling in. Thanks for having me. Of course. Have a great day. When she said he asked a question, I was like, oh, he's going to ask he's asked her about signing a prenup and when she said the diamond thing I was like oh girl that's fine like how what so, do you think about prenups um I I completely understand where people are coming from I just think you I was actually talking to a friend about this recently it's more of a post up um I just think you should get a professional involved so like yeah. a mediator or somebody who does that because I think even couples who love each other like so the ground can go about it the wrong way it makes sense like I I don't know like the only thing of value I own in the world now is my flat which I worked really hard to buy and I'm like oh if I was getting married tomorrow to somebody who I don't know wasn't in that same position I like I feel very I know for instance I will never put somebody else's name on this mortgage for instance like I'm like Mm -hmm. this is mine and that for Mm -hmm. me is like a protection thing not about how much she loved them, but I'm just like, this is my thing. I need to protect it. So yeah, I'm, mm-hmm. I'm kind of pro it. Yeah, I am too. I also just think it's it's not because of what you think about the relationship. It's how wild, I, I don't know how it is over there, but here it's like the man can get anything or like everything. It's like very archaic. It's very wild that it's like, you know, basically my a lawyer explained it to me that it was developed so that when if if and when a woman decides to stop working and isn't contributing financially to the relationship, that she has protection in that, right? Like yeah. I'm not working because I'm raising the kids. And so I can't earn money rather than like somebody being like, Well, you didn't work, so you don't get anything. So it's like Yeah. This bat I mean, whatever. It it all it's feels about, very yeah, like nineteen fifty two. Yeah. Anyway. But, but, I mean, but that is also still a structure that still happens. Like people take time off to, you know, look after kids and like their career or their earning capacity takes a hit. So like if at some point in time, you know, the marriage splits up, like I've, I think it's fair to kind of compensate for that or to make, make them whole again. So I get it. I think it just needs to be more of a pragmatic and not an emotional conversation, but it's hard to do that on your own. Yeah, I agree. I agree. 
Um, let's take our second caller. Hello. Hi. How are you both? I'm great. How are you? Good. Thank you so much for having me today. I really appreciate it. Oh, we're very excited to take your call. Very. Amazing. Hi, Otega. Nice to meet you as well. I A large portion of my story takes place in London, so I feel like it's very apt. <laughs> oh, cool. Good, perfect. Okay, right, yeah. I'm very excited to hear this. <laughs> Amazing. Um, all right, should I dive in then? Dive right in. Let's go. Okay, amazing. Um, so the story is about me and my best friend. We met in high school. We're now both 28. I got married last year and she was my maid of honor. My sister-in-law had a lot of ideas and a lot of those ideas were, were shut down by my maid of honor um, because she felt like financially they did not make a lot of sense um, and, and she didn't want to spend money on those things. Um, fast forward a little bit, a week before my wedding, I was laid off um honestly a blessing and my wonderful husband was like how about you use this time to focus on what you really love and are passionate about um so I pursued baking um Allison very much inspired by you I started my own sub stack um so I could share my recipes um with my friends and family um uh, me and my friend decided to take a trip together so we went to London and I think you know you you see your friend's occasionally but then a trip can really highlight um some of the differences that you have i think that was particularly highlighted on this trip whether it was modes of transportation that we wanted to take restaurants we wanted to go to or shopping when we went to harrods and we were walking through the store and everything that i would pick up just to look at uh she would kind of call out on it and be like oh you can afford that and i can't and it just kind of put a damper on on the whole day. And, and I became very self-conscious to even look at anything. And we then went to the bathroom before heading out of the store. And you know how there's this like a paper towel dispenser, so there's like the trash can right under it. So in one of those was an empty Louis Vuitton shopping bag. Um, She had pulled out the bag and was like, oh my God, this is such a great find. I'm so excited that I have this and I'm going to use this as like my beach bag. And I the shock must have been a little bit on my face. It, it felt a little bit strange to me that she wanted this bag without actually having purchased the item. Um, and she kind of wanted to use it as like a status symbol. And I think she noticed my reaction. And when we were walking back to our hotel, she sort of made a, a statement about how she feels like our, our lives are, are sort of diverging and how we're going to be in sort of different places in the next five years. I think, well, finances is maybe the impetus of a lot of the issues we experience on the trip. It's more so how we were interacting with each other. And I honestly felt like shit a lot of the time um, around her and, and just because of my ability to afford things. So yeah, I, I hope that is clear. This is like a very 28 year old, like it all sort of starts to come into focus in your late twenties question of like, are we the same types of people? Are we going in the same direction, whether it's a romantic partner or a friendship or a job or an apartment, you really start to like outgrow certain things. And sometimes you grow with each other and sometimes you don't. Yeah. Um, there's a lot to unpack here in this question. <laughs> um, Otega, do you have any thought preliminary thoughts? I've been in that position on both sides of the coin where I'm with someone who has, I guess, more money or has more spending power or has more financial ease than I currently do. And I've also been on the opposite side where I'm the person who has like a bit more money. Um, and I've always thought, or I, I now think that it is incumbent on the person who, in the situation who potentially, you know, has more comfortable finances, which currently seems like it's you in the situation, mm -hmm. to be, uh, to kind of, I guess, adjust the sorts of things that you do in terms of like the activities that you do so it's like okay if you're you know on holiday and you want to go to a restaurant like maybe not going to like the super expensive place and maybe right. finding somewhere that is probably a bit more comfortable it does sound like you are even the fact that you're kind of calling in asking this question it does sound like you're empathetic I think that like I always try and extend a little bit of grace in terms of a friend potentially feeling uncomfortable 
in that mm-hmm. respect and mm-hmm. just certain things ignore it doesn't mean you have to ignore it if they are veering into like passive aggressiveness or like making comments or doing things that like really makes you feel uncomfortable I do think that is something you can address it also sounds like from what you've said about your partners I imagine that some of what is difficult for your friend to reckon with is that an aspect of this kind of difference in financial status currently I might be wrong on this is mm-hmm. also in part to do with what your respective partners do is mm-hmm. that you sort of sum that up but I also think that the bee in the bonnet about the what do you call it the dust bag yeah, that's yeah. that's sort of that feels like you're just mad at her for being a hypocrite. And that makes you feel like she's somehow tugging at your insecurities for like making you feel like you can't be celebrated, which is like a deeper issue in the friendship. But mm-hmm. the fact that you're willing to she's willing to posture as if like that is her life, but also judge it if it's yours. And that yeah. feels shitty. And that's like it it could also just not mean anything. She could also be like, this is cool. I like this bag. And also I'm annoyed that I don't have as much money as you do. It could be that yeah. simple, you know? And yeah. I think that it's up to you to sort of protect yourself and feel like, okay, I'm not going to take this personally. I'm going to be sympathetic in that. Like when we go shopping or we suggest places to eat or whatever, like I'm just going to be mindful of the fact that she doesn't have as much money as me because that would yeah. make me feel bad if the situation were reversed, you know? And yeah. then- what that means for the future of your friendship, I don't know. I mean, finances ebb and flow so drastically that this, unless it's like indicative of like a bigger friendship issue, will probably just like even itself out. Um, it's uncomfortable. There's like a that famous Friends episode about it where they like, yeah. where yeah. he like gets the soup or whatever. And, but that to me, like, there's friends that I have in my life that have way more money than me and friends that have way mm-hmm. less money than me. And, I know that if I'm going out to dinner with the friends that have way more money than me, I will pick the restaurant and that like immediately sets it on like my playing field. And like, there's just only so much you can spend at certain places. Um, But, or like you order what you want. I I don't know. It's like, I also try not to make people feel uncomfortable. Like at this point in my, honestly, I'm 38. So it's not the, the gulf isn't too large in either direction. I'm not like friends with billionaires. So like, it's (laughs) not that huge, you know, most people we would make around ish the same, you know, within reason, but like, I don't, I, I also, you know what, you know, what also happens when you get older, you have a lot more of an easy time saying, Hey, do you mind if we go somewhere on the lower end tonight? Yeah. Or like, I'm feeling stressed about money right now. Do you mind if we eat at home? Like I've had so many of those conversations with friends and that's all it takes. And you're just like, yeah, absolutely. Rather than it being like this thing that you don't talk about. Because again, we need to talk about money. Right. (laughs) (laughs) Um, Um, But I do think that this, this is like, it sounds like you can have your life with your partner and she can have her life with her partner. And while that looks different when you guys are alone, living your own mm -hmm. lives, When you're Mm -hmm. together as a friendship, as a couple, as a foursome, whatever, you can just be mindful of that and still have a really good time and still do the things that you like doing together without it feeling like an elephant in the room. Right. Hello, friends and solicited advice listeners. I am here to tell you about Airbnb. I love going to the farmer's market in whatever city that I'm traveling in. And the ideal scenario is that like I can at least once on my trip cook a really nice dinner for myself and whoever I'm traveling with. If I have some friends in the city, they can come too. But it just feels more personal. It feels more intimate. And I've had some of my most memorable travel moments staying in an Airbnb. It's also such a great way to travel with friends because you can get a big house and there can be multiple bedrooms and you can all share your meals together. And you can like really be at home at an Airbnb. And the nice thing about traveling is that, you know, you might be thinking, well, what's going to, who's going to stay at my house? I'm staying at someone else's house. Who's going to stay at mine? Well, you could consider being a host and then you can return the favor to somebody else and provide for them the same kind of excellent service that somebody is providing for you. And your home might just be worth more than you think. You can find out how much at airbnb.com slash host. Hello, everybody. This is me taking a moment to thank our sponsor, Seed, for sponsoring this week's episode. I famously don't take care of myself in the summer. I sort of do the opposite with the exception of two things. One, I always wear sunscreen. I have for years on my face, my body. I don't leave the house without it. And I still take my multivitamin and my daily seed 
because in a world of chaos, it does feel really helpful to have like one tiny thing that you do every day that says, I care about myself and my body. Uh, the difference that I feel when I'm taking seed versus not taking seed, I, I won't get into too many details because we don't need to hear that right now. But I will say that like my whole body seems to function better, especially from within, if you catch my drift. So support your gut health this summer with Seeds DS01 Daily Symbiotic. Go to seed.com slash Allison and use code 25 Allison to get 25% off your first month. That's 25% off your first month of Seeds DS1 Daily Symbiotic at seed.com slash advice code. 25 advice. Was that yeah. helpful at all? I feel like there was a lot to unravel there. And what's your relationship been like in those past few months? Have you spoken? Or? We haven't spoken. I received an invite for her birthday, which is in two weeks, and I haven't responded yet, and I don't really know what to do. I think do you want to go? Oh, yeah. Um, Kind of no. I, it I, sounds like you don't want to be friends with her anymore. Yeah. It's, it's tough because I feel like I it's one, it, I, I think the length of time, not that that I sh think should be a reason. And, and we have so much history. It feels crazy that like this person was my maid of honor like last year and now it's just over. Yeah. I mean, I, as yeah, uh, friendships are really, really tough. And people that are, I, there was a person who I was in their wedding. I made their wedding cake. I'm, we're not friends anymore. You know, like it, yeah. it just, it does happen because sometimes the closer you are, there's a bigger risk of it exploding fantastically. And that gives you a higher margin of irreconcil irreconcilability, irreconcilability. What, <laughs> what is the word I'm trying to say? Uh, a higher chance that you might not reconcile. Yeah. Um, and that is sort of like a shedding of, of stuff as you get older. It's really, sorry to, that's not very hopeful. But it also could be an ebb and flow. I have a friend that we didn't speak for three or four years. It, we like got in a huge fight. We did not speak. It was like, you are dead to me. And then we ran into each other on the street once and like ran towards each other, gave each other a hug and like picked it back up. And we're like, I yeah. missed you. And now we're friends. You know what I mean? So like, right. it does happen. And sometimes you don't know where people, I, I don't know. There's so many reasons why friendships don't end up working out. But it sounds like you're sort of mourning that and using this financial sort of incident as like an impetus. But it sounds like to me that there's other things going on between her, either her style of communication or her values or something that like isn't really aligning with how you want to move forward with your life. Yeah. I feel like if I, if I shared all of it, we'd be here all day, but I think ultimately it coming down to me feeling like what is the right balance of you are there for your friend when maybe they're going through a lot. And then do you also, is it okay to like always feel like shit when you're with them because they kind of put you down? It's not. And that's the kind of friend that it's okay to like distance yourself from or just like manage the expectation of like, I'm happy to be with them in a group. I'll go to the birthday party because there's going to be a ton of people there that I know and I want to see. Yeah. And then see them very sporadically and like keep the peace because you want them vaguely in your life, but like, you're not ready to like draw the line in the sand. Like we're not friends anymore, but right. you don't have to put so much effort in. Yeah. That's why I was pro you going to the birthday party. Cause I'm like, that's a group setting. It's not like right. one on one pressure. You're like still being there for the significant life milestone or celebration. And then that's kind of like your kind of like check-in for like this quarter or maybe it's for this year, you know, that, Right. I, I think allow for like the ebb and flow because yeah, similarly to Alison, like I've definitely had friendships where uh, I've kind of thought, you know, I think that's it. Like we haven't like had like a falling out, but it's been like, oh, right. there was tension. And then we have actually come back together. Sometimes we've ended up having really honest conversations about what it was that led to that wedge. So I'm like, mm -hmm. don't like completely like cut off, but you should not, have to spend time around a friend who makes you shit like that that isn't friendship so I think it's fine to take a bit of distance especially as you've already broached like that topic with her I feel like that is like a little, a little bit of a warning sign to her to be like hey like I noticed this I heard this that what's right. going on there hopefully will make her think twice yeah I think that's oh, sorry I was gonna say I hope that's a little bit helpful I know that was like a lot to get through and a very nuanced yeah, that was 
very helpful. I, I feel like I'm walking away with like the comfort of like, I don't need to draw a line in the sand of like, this friendship is over. I don't need to declare it. It It is just ebbing and flowing. And we'll sort of see where it goes. Yeah. And some of the best friendships ebb and flow. I have people in my life that I consider some of my best friends. Sometimes we talk every day. Sometimes we don't talk for weeks. And yeah. it's like the security of knowing that like this person's going to be in my life for forever. And then, you know, the opposite of where the backing off sort of results in like you being like, oh yeah, we're really just not that close anymore without any drama attached, which is also fine. So yeah. Yeah. the best thing for you will happen. Don't worry. It'll, it'll emerge. Thank you. I so yeah. appreciate it. Take care. Thank you for calling in. Bye. Bye. That was so sweet. Um, it was a lot. So much. Yeah. I was like, okay, this person, sometimes when on the show now, I'm like at the end of their question, I'm like, oh, you're 28. You know, like, I'm like, oh, yeah. you're just going through it. You are, your whole life is sort of expanding, contracting. It's ebbing, it's flowing. Things are different. Nothing is the same. People move, they change, they grow. It's like very, I forget how, uh, how that can feel. Um, although I still feel like I feel that way sometimes. I still feel that way, but I think it's just for different reasons. But that specific late twenties thing of like money coming into your friendships and like, people's lifestyles really diverging and the choices people made whether it's career or partner or where they're living or like all of these things really start coming home to roost and it can be really confronting because up until that point in time it's like well, we're all the same like we've all seen each other we're all the same it's like yeah haven't been that many kind of differentiators between us and I think yeah that is I remember that period of time being uh difficult for me to like mentally process but yeah there's also just no precedent you know everyone's kind of doing it for the first time and like we're all just doing our best but oh boy sometimes that best is not that good okay so now it's time for our chef's kiss portion of the podcast I always like to say the evening but you can listen to this podcast <laughs> any time of day um of the podcast where people call in they leave their questions and we answer them as quickly as we can um if you would like to call in either for a one-on-one -on -one sesh or to leave a quick voicemail, you can call at, God, if I ever remember this number, I swear to God, 856-502-4816. Um, my husband asked me that if I knew his phone number by heart and I said, no. And he was so offended. And I said, do you know mine? And he's like, yeah. And then said a, a, a number that wasn't mine. And I was like, okay, sit down. <laughs> um, all right, let's take our first call. Oh, hi, Allison Roman. This is Kristen. I'm calling from uh, Peterborough, Ontario, Canada. And my question was, do you ever think about or resent the amount of money that it seems women have to spend on their hair? So that could be like cutting or dyeing. It just seems to cost an exorbitant amount more than uh, males. And do you ever do your hair yourself? Yes or no and why? Thanks. Uh, yeah, I do huge especially when they complain about it when they're like that haircut cost 75 dollars i'm like oh it did it cost 75 dollars i would do anything to pay 75 dollars for a haircut I, like, I feel like you were just talking about this you were like looking for somebody yeah, in london i just i often feel resentful about the amount of <laughs> do you know, it's actually, it's like the amount of money but also often the amount of time that like oh. the beauty work takes up I'm like okay I have to go to this place and go to that place and, and my solution to it has been I think I do less now than I did in my 20s mm. like I I used to be like back to back manicures and pedicures like every two weeks I was back in there I basically don't do that anymore unless I'm like really going to like a special event or I'm going on holiday so I'll like get like a Petty or a manny like a few times a year as opposed to back to back because oh, wow. I was like I can't just sit here for however long especially as like with a manicure you can't use your hands um yeah it's tough and, yeah it's kind of nice I, though I, I like take it as like no phone time no I think you know I think I used to but I think I just hit my ceiling with it I genuinely yeah. I used to love it and I just hit my ceiling with it um I obviously have to spend a lot of time and money on my hair um especially money because I don't know what it's like in the US or New York, it's probably better than the UK, but it's like, as a black woman, there aren't as many choices and the choice, the only good choices there are expensive. So I'm like, mm -hmm. um, yeah, I feel, I do feel resentful. I feel like that, oh, is that the kind of answer to the question? But yeah. I feel like 
something that's like bothering you just like do less and like yeah. used to doing less and then that becomes your baseline and you don't suddenly feel naked without a manicure or a pedicure like I'm growing out my eyebrows right now which sounds what do you growing out I what know were they before? I, haven't, I haven't plucked them in I think actually like can you see they I look great I mean you look you look like you you know I didn't notice a perceptible difference but I'm not you know in the room with you I, were you over I, plucking I felt like I had over plucked and I just felt like the shape that I had to turn them into was like not my natural shape and therefore required maintenance. Mm. So now I'm on this experiment of like, can are you, I- like, Are you using anything like a, like a grow gel or something? Nothing, nothing. Okay. Yeah. And it's like, it's been, I don't know, I don't know how many, like four months since I like last plucked them and they're growing back like pretty- for somebody who's been since I was like 12, I'm like, I'm quite pleased with their progress. So yeah. I'm, like, I'm just going for like a different shape that's more natural. It looks great. And then, yeah, thank you. <laughs> yeah, I I let one person touch my eyebrows basically and she kind of just does them naturally. But I overplucked as a teen and so they're not as full Ooh. now as an adult Ooh. as they probably could have been. Same. And like, yeah, if anyone is listening and thinking about overplucking, please don't. Um, I worry about the girls that are bleaching. Cause I'm like, that could be irreversible damage to your eyebrows okay. and you might want those one day. Yeah. I mean, yeah, I was a person so off my radar. Hair. I'm not cool enough to. No, eat. you've seen them like in an essence ad. Oh yeah, totally. Yeah. But I'm just like, you, not like you a real know. person. Yeah. I don't know anyone, like no one in my exactly. real life. Um, yeah. Anyway, but yeah, long story short, we do resent it. I've never done my own hair. I've never cut or colored my own hair. I can't even blow dry my own hair. Um, I spend money on blowouts or someone to like come do it. Anytime someone's like, your hair looks nice. I'm like, oh, thanks. Somebody else did it. My hair, I just, I've never learned. And so I outsource and yeah, I do resent it, but I also like to look and feel my best. Um, okay. Next question. Hi. Um, I'm calling with a question about a friend of mine who has just like no generational wealth and is just someone who like ha is poor but also very impulsive and I've been trying to help them with like some budgeting and stuff and bumping up against this question of like when I budget I make not a huge salary I make a five-figure salary but when I budget I'm like sometimes I like at the end of my budget I eat like beans and rice but I don't think that like somebody who's poor should fucking have to eat beans and rice all the time but it's hard to tell somebody that like they shouldn't indulge in the things that they enjoy because it saves money because that are like as a consequence of that like poor people would just like enjoy way less which is often true but I don't think should be so I'm just kind of wondering like how you like distinguish when you think about people who have like less like disposable income like distinguishing between like what is like a necessity for your life but also like what's important for like your dignity and like fulfilling your you know making yourself happy and stuff and how money plays into that mm. I mean you're asking a person who when they didn't have any money was at the Commodore every night like eating like fried chicken and drinking pina coladas and I was like this is the money I have and this is what makes me happy so I'm doing it and then would like overdraft their bank account so when I had less money I was notoriously bad at budgeting and I, I actually didn't even understand the word budget I I did what I wanted and I felt like I had earned that with the money that I had. And because I was single and didn't have kids and only had, like I rented a room in an apartment, like I didn't have a mortgage, I had very little responsibility. And as long as I could make rent and like pay for my cell phone, that was really all I was concerned about. And so anything else that I had left over, I was like, well, this sucks. So like, I am gonna do the things that make me happy. Well, that's a real, yeah, there's definitely like a mindset. It's, it's an interesting like that is a way of doing things <laughs> I'm like, I'm like, that's that is I'm a like, way that's certainly one form of budgeting yeah <laughs> but i think that is like a real like documented thing so when people don't have a lot of money when they do get even a small amount of money they spend it immediately it's called like a scarcity i wrote about it in my back comment it's called like a scarcity mindset or like mm. but it's very much a well-documented thing and i think the question that i have or like the way i would think about it with that friend is like do they actually have enough money to budget? Because I think I'm always really reluctant to give people like budgeting advice or saving advice when we live in a time in the economy where like a lot of people can't afford to budget or save. It's like it, you can budget and save if you have spare income and disposable income. But like if you are just like barely 
surviving and barely kind of keeping afloat, then those sorts of conversations, I feel like they just kind of make people feel bad. And it's kind of like beating them over the head of the stick. It's like, this is why, you know, you're broke at the end of every month. But it's like, it's not necessarily because they're spending the money in bad ways, it's because they just do not have enough money. So I think that is always a distinction that I think about. And seeing as you describe this person as poor, I'm like, is this a question of them not spending their money in the wisest ways? which is one thing, or is it just they do not have enough money, which is like a completely separate issue and that you you or they would kind of have to like look at what the reasons for that and like if there's anything to be done to change that. But like, I'm just reluctant to give advice to somebody who has been described as poor on like budgeting because I'm like, I, I, I don't know if they necessarily can budget. Yeah, I feel the same way. And yeah, I think any person who's experienced like financial scarcity in that way, like I like to say that that's also why I didn't budget at the time. Like I didn't have like a fallback plan. I didn't have like a nest egg. I didn't have anyone I could call. It was like what I had was what I had. And it was like, I didn't have the option. It was like, you have like this much left and you're like, well, this is what I am going to spend it on. I don't know. It didn't, it feels like the more money you have, the more money you can actually budget. And you can say, okay, well, I'm allocating X, you know, they're like, okay, your rent should be this and your rent should be that. And I'm like, yeah, it all should be, but like, it's not, it's this. And like, that's what I'm doing. And that's how this is. Like, it just becomes less of an option. Um, do you think they were talking about like a friend of theirs? Like they wanted to give them advice? Yeah, I think, I think so. But I feel like sometimes it's just like, is this more of like an emotional support thing? Yeah. You know, as to... yeah, I think it should be if it's not, I would know ne- I've never given a friend financial advice especially if they didn't ask for it. Yeah. Do you talk about money with your friends? All the time. Yeah. All the time. Um, we, talk, we, talk, we talk vaguely, but we don't really talk specifics, my friends and I. I mean, I went over to a friend's house for dinner on Friday night and we like talked about recent jobs that we've booked and how much we were paid for. It. Like we were just kind of like running through. That's awesome. Like, do some stuff and like, it, I mean, that wasn't the purpose of why I went over, but like it just came up and I'm. it's just very, like it comes easily to me. But I have those conversations to like make sure I'm not being unpaid and like that's kind oh, of Oh, totally. It's so important. Yeah. But yeah, I don't know. I, I, think, I think just naturally because of what I've written about, my friends do tend to come to me with money conversations. I don't know what they're like with each other. I'm like, they talk to me about money, but I don't know if they're talking to each other about me. Yeah. Maybe. Um, okay, I think we have time for one more call. Hi, Allison. This is Sierra. I'm calling from Sacramento, California. Um, I just wanted to ask you, because here in Sacramento, we have a lot of great farmer's markets. Um, and with the prices, like in grocery stores, getting really expensive lately, I've found that like farmer's markets tend to be more affordable. So I've been exploring that more than I used to. I was wondering how you like to decide what like pantry or like fridge items you want to purchase at a farmer's market versus purchasing them at the supermarket. (laughs) Anyway, that's it. Thank you. I love this question because I think I talk about it a lot and I like, I mean, I at least think about it a lot, but basically I think about it in terms of like I grocery shop the way that I clothing shop if that makes sense. And there are certain things that I think are worth the money and I spend it on and certain things that I don't, certain things that make a difference, certain things that don't. So like if I'm at the farmer's market, I'm buying like beautiful tiny carrots or like a cool radish or gorgeous salad greens, like nice fish or meat if that's available, or I'll go to a butcher or fish market for that. Um, like a, a certain like cool potato. <laughs> like I don't know, I, I keep calling it like a vegetable cool, but it is to me very cool. Um, if I know there's like a guy that has amazing garlic, I'm going to buy it from them. Like there are just certain ingredients that cannot be farmed en masse. Certain things like a bag of yellow onions, I'll probably just buy at the grocery store. A bag of flour, a bag of, I don't know, shallots, God forbid. I have to buy them somewhere else other than the farmer's market. But like certain things are just not to me, like worth going out of your way for. So I bisect my like shopping by that. So I go to the farmer's market and I'm like, I'm going to get like the beautiful greens, the like fresh herbs, the things that are grown with care. Fruit is especially something I feel passionately about going to the farmer's market for. Um, Tomatoes, also a fruit, I suppose. Um, 
but yeah, there's like other things where I'm like, if I'm going to get a box of spinach to put in my morning smoothie, I'm just going to get like the organic spinach from a bag at the store. Like, that's just what I'm going to do. But I feel that way when I dress where I'm like, I'm going to spend like the money on like the bag or the shoes that are going to really make the outfit. And I'm going to wear my Levi's and my like regular white t-shirt and like a toe temp belt or whatever, you know, like something that's going to make the the dish, make the outfit. I feel comfortable spending money on, but if it's like a run of the mill, basic something, I feel like I really struggle to spend the money on. I understand. I think I'm quite similar. I spend my outfit expenditure, the money goes on the shoes. I'm like, mm. I build my way upward from the shoes, nice pair of shoes, and then everything else can come online. I'm quite curious about the kind of like farmer's market phenomenon because we don't like, I think we don't really have that that no. much in the UK. Like not in the same way that I get the impression that you have that in New York or LA. I tried like, to find it. When yeah, I'm, I'm like, where's the farmer's like market? Novel, we'll have like a novelty farmer's market that like pops up like one weekend out of like four. Like it's just like, like sponsored very, by like, Natura. Yeah. Yeah. It's very like, oh my God, novelty. Have you heard there's a farmer's market in town? But like we don't have that. So I just order all of my uh, groceries online. But yeah. And I still order a lot of my groceries online, but also like the way like Rush Direct is where I get my orders my groceries online, not sponsored, but I have partnered with them in the past, but their produce tends to be really good. So I feel confident that I can order it from them. But I actually find that farmer's market produce in New York city specifically is kind of outrageously expensive. Um, and so I do realize that it's cost prohibitive. So I, I would recommend that people spend what they're comfortable on. I'd rather you have fresh parsley and fresh dill, fresh, whatever in the house, than feel like well, I can't because at the farmer's market, it's $5 a bunch. It's like, well, you can get it $2 a bunch at the price chopper or whatever. It's like, you know, you vote with your dollars, et cetera, et cetera. But I also think that like spending money on food is not something that people always have the option to do. And I, I would say, I would rather you buy it from where you can afford it than feel like you can't partake in that at all, if that makes sense. It's very dem democratic. I try, I, I think about it you all the time. I really do. Um, but now that I, and now that I own a little grocery store, I also like have a much better and deeper understanding of how much things cost. Like what the farmers charge me to buy it wholesale means I have to charge X for the customer to like meet my margins to make sure that I can like keep the lights on literally. And all of that, just like, unless you're buying en masse, it is going to be more expensive. So like farmers markets, small farms, like they tend to be pricier because they are doing things themselves. They're doing things by hand. They don't have subsidies. They don't have big companies backing them. Like it just, it takes more work. It takes more time. And I firmly believe that we should like eat well and spend the money on the things that like support our values. And if you value like fair wages for farmers, you know, small, small farming, practices, things that are better for the environment, the animals, um, et cetera, then like that's where you should spend your money on. Totally. I often feel like people, and I include myself in that, but like consumers often have a really skewed sense of how much things should cost. So I think about that mm -hmm. in terms of clothes, obviously it applies in terms of food, but because we have like huge conglomerates who've essentially kind of massively altered the market because they can purchase at scale or they're underpaying people to but he's yeah. goes in a sweatshop shop somewhere. Like when somebody comes in and they have priced things at a level that reflects their value, quality, paying people, well, all of those things, people are like, oh my God, that's so overpriced, like $500 for this knitted jumper. And I'm like, oh, well actually, if you kind of like work backwards, you would be shocked yeah. at like how little profit is being built into that. Yeah. So where does the fabric come from? I'm, Who's making it? Yeah. yeah. It's yeah. something I'm trying to be more conscious of generally in terms of, how I spend money I'm like just because something is out of my budget does not mm -hmm. mean cost, you know yeah I feel that way too I feel a lot of guilt with clothing these days but I'm I'm not like intentionally on a buying freeze I'm just more on like a I haven't found anything that I'm I'm in a fashion crisis but that's another episode um Otega thank you so much for taking the time and for being here with us and for answering these questions you were so helpful you're very very good that's insane. Thank you so much yeah. for having me. It's always such a pleasure to talk to you. Um, oh, yeah, I'm always. sorry for my tech issues. 
but I cannot wait to hang out in person in real life. I know. I can't wait. Uh, we'll text you, but yeah, we'll be there in mid July or mid June ish. Um, and if you again, want to call in, if you're listening and you're like, I just have got to call, you can call in at 856-502-4816. And I didn't even have to look at the number. Um, I looked at my phone, but I couldn't find it, but I think I nailed it. Solicited advice is hosted by me, Allison Roman. Our podcast is produced by Maria Robin Somerville with the help of Elena Rodriguez Villa. Video editing by Leah Somerville. Our theme music was created by Yosef Monroe. You can watch a video version of this podcast on my YouTube channel. And for questions, sponsorship inquiries, or anything else, please visit us at allisonemroman.com slash podcast. <laughs>